All right, good morning, good morning. It is a real pleasure for me, an honor for me to, uh, to get to share some of what I do, a little piece of my world uh, with you. I love my job, I love what I get to do, and, and I enjoy getting to talk about it. So, but first I wanted to say a couple things. This is my third, I think it is the third, uh, uh, auto pack. And it's been a real joy for me to see this grow and to mature over the years into a real high quality event. Uh, I think that it fills a niche in, in our environment, evidenced by all of you being here this morning uh, for what, what looks like a real, real full day of, of excellent content. But I want to encourage you to, to not miss the fact that intentionally in the schedule as I was looking through it, in addition to some great content, are some real opportunities to network with one another. And if you're like me, your emails are building up and you're maybe getting vibrated because your, your, uh, your messages are lighting up, I, I encourage you to use this time uh, to get to know one another. That is probably the single most valuable aspect of some of these events that I go to on a yearly basis is the opportunity, opportunity to network. Um, Automotive, it's, you know, packaging is a huge industry. Automotive is a huge industry. Automotive packaging is a huge industry. But we're really kind of a small group, aren't we? And, uh, and we see a lot of the faces again and again at, at, these, uh, at these kind of events. Um, like last night, and it was a real pleasure for me, I think, last night at, that, at, the, uh, at the reception was to see some of our alumni from the packaging program at Clemson University, to see these guys engaged out there, tearing things up, um, I, uh, go Tigers. So it was, it was great to see you guys last night. Um, what I want to do is take the next 30 minutes or so and give you an overview of distribution package testing. Okay? This is, for some of you, this is going to be an area that you're well familiar with. And I hope for you in this presentation that there will be a couple nuggets that you can take away from this. For others of you, uh, this might be brand new. In which case, what I hope I'm able to demonstrate this morning is the value you can bring to your organization by incorporating package testing into your, pack into your packaging development, even into your product development. If we can push that back so far as to, uh, to move it into the product development uh, stage as well, then the, the value that that can bring to your company. So we're going to give an overview. Of, of what package testing looks like, some of the organizations that publish standards, and what's available to you uh, for, for package testing. But, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit where I'm coming from. It kind of informs my approach to, to package design. I, I've been schooled largely in the area of, of mechanical engineering and packaging di and dynamics, vibrations, and kind of nonlinear dynamics. Uh, I've been at the university for about 18 years, and they, I think they've given me every title that you can have uh, and, and, and get to teach. Uh, so I get to, I get to teach and research in this area of packaging dynamics, and, uh, and I get to work alongside with some of the greatest students in the country, I really think, and, uh, and, and love doing so. There is an industry connection. I try to, it's important for us in academia, especially a guy that's been there for 18 years, to maintain a connection with industry. And I do this largely through a couple of organizations for whom I sit on board of directors uh, for a journal, for, for a research group. But what I wanted to highlight was the International Safe Transit Association. Uh, I serve on their global board of directors and have for several years. I've been able to look behind the scenes, really, behind the curtain of this organization and all that it's doing to update and provide standards that you all can use to evaluate your package products. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, like James, we've got a facility at Clemson that, uh, that, I, that I serve as director of that provides, in addition to, to uh, meeting the needs of our undergraduate students and our graduate students, we also provide for industry and the way of testing services. And we're happy to, to talk on the phone and, and work with you to develop test protocols uh, to provide those testing services, material evaluation, and, and even, even some consulting services. So this is us, and I, I really want to start with why, why do this? Why, why test? Um, can I just put my package product in the back of the truck and send it from point A to point B and open the truck up and take a look and, and see what happens inside? Um, why do I need to go, go into a laboratory 
and, and conduct this kind of testing. And, and first of all, I'd say that's a great idea to, to actually do the field evaluation. Um, but, but what I want to do is give you some reasons why we want to bring this into the lab. And, and it affords us the ability to get a closer look at what's going on. Because maybe that truck driver was having a good day. Okay? Maybe he took a, took a nice route from point A to point B. Uh, maybe the handling, mechanical handling of that. Everybody was in a good mood. It was Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon. Everybody is happy. And, and, but what if it wasn't? You don't know what you're getting when we do these field trials. So when we come into a laboratory, uh, we, we have the ability to control the environment. Okay? We can isolate down to a particular hazard, not just what happened between point A and point B, but we were able to isolate down. This is a shock issue. This is a vibration issue. We're having an issue with compression forces. And we don't, need to, we don't need to worry about these other here. Let's focus our attention there. So we, we have the ability to control the environment. We have the, the ability to generate, to create repeatable tests. Why is that important? If I'm making financial decisions between packaging A, packaging B, and packaging C, I need to, t I need to test all three of those the exact same way, don't I? Uh, in a side-by-side -side comparison with a test, that, a test that's repeatable. There is something valuable about watching your, your package products pass or fail these tests. Uh, one of my encouragements to you later in this presentation is to be there if you can, to hear, to see uh, what happens when things go wrong. We can learn a lot by, by just being there and watching things fail. We don't get the opportunity to do this in the back of a truck. Accelerated testing. This is particularly applicable to vibration. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about this, but the ability to take a 10-hour truck ride and simulate the damage potential of that in three hours. Well, now I can do two of those tests in a day, and I can turn, maybe shorten my development process. And then lastly, uh, we get immediate feedback. Okay, we can, we can go in, into the lab and we can make modifications uh, we can uh, try, try different configurations and then go and immediately retest. And again, an opportunity to shorten, shorten that development time. Okay, so when we look at performance testing, there's, there's really three, three ways that you'll see these, these tests broken down. Uh, the three levels of testing, if you will. The first is a very basic level of testing called an integrity test. This is really great for comparing A to B to C. There, these are typically pretty intense tests, intense vibration, intense shocks for the purpose of, and what we would like in a test like this is to see some level of damage so that we're able to differentiate between our different, different packaging options. Or maybe our distribution environment is so complex and we have so many different options on the way things could be handled that we don't have any data specific to one lane or one, one distribution uh, cycle that, that we could use to simulate. So we're just going to use a very basic test at a high intensity level just to see how, how, this, how those types of inputs that do exist in the environment could potentially affect our package product. So that's kind of base level testing. Very simple, inexpensive to do. The next level up, you see the word simulation come in here, general simulation. Uh, this is, it, we are actually simulating what happens in a particular distribution environment. So we're making choices like we have an air ride truck. We're making choices like this is how many miles we, we expect to drive. We make decisions based on we know how many high we're going to stack these in a warehouse. So, so this is a next level of, of uh, complexity. It adds a level of complexity to our testing. Uh, it, it, comes at, it takes longer for us to do these tests. There's often some environmental conditioning that occurs that we incorporate into this level of testing. That's kind of our level two testing. What we're beginning to see in working with, working with companies, both automotive, and there are lots of examples of, of this outside of automotive, are companies taking a focused simulation approach, using some generic profiles and some ger generic tools to predict compressive loads is not enough. They want to see what's going on in their particular environment. Most of us in this room are, are carrying a data recorder of some, some form, right? Maybe in our watch, maybe definitely in our phone. With, with the proliferation of, of, of data recorders and the opportunity to collect our own data, 
we, I see companies and we're working with companies who are instrumenting their trucks, their drivers, they're looking at their mechanical handling and, and uh, measuring, analyzing, and then using that data to inform their, their test standard, okay? So that we have company-specific test standards. A uh, very popular one of these, and uh, fortunately you guys don't sell, uh, to my knowledge, you're not selling automotive products directly on Amazon, uh, but that's a big one right now. I just came from a conference last week in Chicago focused on this e-commerce and, and all the changes that, that that's bringing about uh, for, for package testing. Some organizations that publish these standards uh, are come out, and you'll recognize many of the many in this list. I'm going to focus on the first two because I think that these organizations, the International Safe Transit Association, ASTM, are in, is particularly here in the U.S. are two dominant uh, standard writing organizations that are doing work in advancing their standards. And so I want to focus a little bit more on them. But, uh, but also ISO, we go outside the, outside the U.S., we see ISO, uh, the military, for our military products. Um, hazardous materials, I see we have a speaker coming up to, to focus on hazardous materials governed by the Department of Transportation. And if you ship in the less than truckload, the LTL environment, uh, then you're dealing with the NMFTA, the National Motor Freight Traffic Association. So, ISTA. The International Safe Transit Association uh, is a small organization uh, based out of, out of uh, Michigan that is focused solely on publishing standards for the simulation of distribution environments. Okay? They will actually reference ASTM standards on how to set up equipment. Okay? They don't get into that. Their focus and the focus uh, 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 the, the current efforts they have at characterizing distribution environments is for the purpose of generating and updating standards related to the simulation of particular environments. Okay, and we can talk a little bit more about that uh, later. They also offer the opportunity to certify packages. So you take one of their tests and you take your package product, you go to a certified lab, you're a member of ISTA, your, your package product passes the test, and it enables you to put a transit tested stamp on, on your box saying, we've done the best we can to assure that our package product system is designed to survive this particular environment, okay? Maybe like signing the waiver form and acknowledge, you know, when you go rafting, okay? It's a, uh, you, we've done, we, we recognize that, um, that we're, we're doing the best we can, okay? They have recently become an ANSYS consensus standard writing body. This might not be a big deal to us in this room, but it really is to the medical products industry. Okay? And they have incorporated some of their standards recently to actually be consensus body standards, which is the next level of, uh, of certification and is important for, uh, for some people in this, in this business of package testing. Another organization is, the, is ASTM International. Their focus is a massive organization publishing all kinds of standards for everything from, uh, uh, from amusement rides to how, to how to cure concrete. They also have a committee, the D10 committee, that is focused on packaging and package testing. And most of their standards in that, in that D10 committee are related to the setup and the proper methods for conducting tests. They publish two standards for the simulation of the distribution environment. And the one, the kind of across the board big one is the, is the D4169, which if you're in this even remotely, you're probably familiar with this, this particular test standard. It's a, it covers a lot of different package product uh, distribution routes. Uh, there is another one, the, the D7386, that is focused just on the small parcel delivery system and, and the growth that we've had on that side of things uh, just in the past 10 years. Okay, so depending on your package product configuration, we generally see a division in, in two different types of uh, a breakdown, and we look at it two different ways, of the types of test elements that your package product would undergo. And this probably makes sense to a lot of us in here. If you're shipping unit loads, then we've got larger, heavier things that we're handling mechanically that might be getting stacked in a warehouse 
that undergo shock events that are very different from the way we might handle a small, small 12 pound package. Okay? So that unit load delivery system is going to involve uh, hazards like atmospheric conditioning, rotational edge and flat drops, uh, incline impact, vibration, compression. Whereas when we move to the small parcel delivery system, our smaller items that we're manually handling that are going through distribution centers and sorting operations and, and ramps and sorting arms and conveyors and, and all of these, uh, we, we still, still are often concerned at the general simulation level with atmospheric conditioning. We look at, instead of rotational drops, uh, rotational flat drops and edge drops, we would see uh, uh, free fall drops, okay, from, from mishandling of packaged products. And we would see vibration and compression often combined. And the reason we do this, these compressive forces that exist in the backs of our, our trucks, planes, and trains, where packaged products are stacked on top of each other and now are undergoing an, an acceleration event because they're moving, that dynamic compressive force we try to reproduce in the lab by uh, testing our packaged product with some design top load on top to simulate what could be placed in, on top of the, the packaged product based on densities of freight that these carriers often, often move. So I, you know, I want to say a little bit about some of these, these primary test elements. Uh, ac you know, the atmospheric conditioning, uh, fortunately for us in the lab and for you as people who have products you need to test, we don't have to bring our entire lab atmosphere up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit and 85% relative humidity. Uh, that, would, that would kill us in the lab. What all of these standards make provision for is, is the ability to, uh, to precondition our samples for some period of time so that we can get, come to equilibrium between the, with the moisture, available moisture in that atmosphere and temperature and our package product. Okay, so that we can immediately bring that out of the chamber and go in and, and start testing. So often these preconditioning times are 24, anywhere from 24 hours to 72 hours, depending on the test method, and oftentimes depending on the, on the package product. Do we have a unit load that's wrapped in plastic and our interior product has a primary package that's also a polymer? Uh, and, and various levels of, of corrugated. If so, we need more time to come to equilibrium, okay, in that example. Um, you know, a concern with this is some of, these, some of these tests run for hours. Some of the vibration tests can be three, four hours long, and we're losing conditions. If we come out of a, a hot and humid and go into a lab atmosphere, we can begin to lose, lose our conditioning. And so oftentimes there's even, uh, it makes sense to go back into the chamber for a period of time to recondition before that big compression test at the end. So, so atmospheric conditioning, we see all the way down from frozen all the way up to, to tropical conditions. Okay, the small package product. I know it seems simple, um, but a, a device that can repeatably drop your package product in the same way every time. When we drop a flat, the spec says you want to drop flat, you got to drop within two degrees of flat so that what we perform to package product A is the same thing we do to B, it's the same thing we do to C, to make enable evil, even comparison and uh, enable us to make, make decisions. Um, a lot of times we will even take those impacts that occur in the, in the distribution systems uh, that aren't manual, that the sorting arms and the slides where they impact other, other package products, we'll take those events and create an equivalent free fall drop event. So based on the velocities of that sorting arm that comes out and hits our package product, we can use that velocity to back out. This is how high we need to drop things from in the lab to simulate that, that mechanical handling event that happens in the distribution center. Okay, another is, and this is a common one, you say, well, wait, can't I just do this out in my shop floor? Yeah, you could. Um, this is, you know, I, I kind of loosely refer to these as the floor exercises of package testing. But if you look at them, they're, there's, they're practical, aren't they? Mechanical mishandling of unit loads 
where four truck driver catches the back end on the, on the unit load behind it, goes to slide forks out and things rotate down and impact. Uh, we're looking for practical connection to application of some of these very simple tests, apparently, that we do in the lab. Not common in the distribution environment, but some of you might be dealing with standards that specify this, is a free fall drop to a unit load. I've not, I've not witnessed one of those. Um, I hope that I never do. Um, but yet we specify this as a test element, to which I would encourage you to consider the, introducing uh, the, the use of a rotational flat drop and or rotational edge drop, as you saw uh, illustrated in the video. Typically done to two adjacent corners of the device, so we're, we're seeing both axes of the unit load and how they respond to the, to the impact forces that transmit through our packaged products and, and uh, you know, that, that are very possible and, and could occur in, in distribution. Okay, another common one for unit loads is this incline impact test. And I think it's important for us to, to think about first to discuss what it is not. What this is not is, is, is simulating rail car coupling. Okay, these rail cars with, with suspension draft gear that when we couple these rail cars in the, on the railroad that could be five, six, seven, as high as eight mile an hour impacts that occur. With rail cars that have suspension systems that are designed to withstand that. And so they take these short duration, high intensity accelerations and they drag them out over a longer period of time. Now the nice thing is for our packaged products, the peak acceleration drops but it creates much lower frequency shock events than we see with the, with the typical incline impact test. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, the test that is done to simulate those uh, in, in a few minutes. But the incline impact test, as you see it here, is specified based on an impact velocity. Okay, so, so we need to reproduce with our little sled up against the stationary backstop a particular impact velocity. Okay, let's say it's four miles an hour. And at that impact velocity, we're going to impact the package product on all four vertical faces of the unit load. And we're looking for, then we look at, at response of the products inside and shifting and ability of the packaging to, to contain things and maintain unit load stability through a test like that. Where does this come from? Truck driver hits the brakes, deacceleration, backing up, hits the loading dock. Uh, the interaction of freight in, in, as we're cornering and, and braking and accelerating, deaccelerating is where we see these short duration, okay, high intensity shock events. And so this is a very common test element for, for unit load testing. Say that probably the single most popular thing we do in the lab is run vibration. It doesn't matter what kind of package product it is. If it comes through our lab, it's gonna spend some kind of time on the vibration table. And, the, the vi and, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because all of us, it's, it's the one input that all of our packaged products undergo. There's some type of transit that takes place. Truck, plane, or train, we're, we're, in, a, uh, we're in a vehicle that is receiving vibration. And so these, these modern vibration systems are capable of reproducing the nature of the motion that exists out in the, out in the environment that we call random vibration. This is vibration that occurs over a range of frequencies and, and at varying intensity levels all at the same time. It's a very complex motion. It's complicated to reproduce. We bring it into a lab and there's some trade-offs. When we do a vibration test, we are not simulating that truck going over potholes or railroad tracks or the speed bump or catching the curb as they go around the corner. Those discrete events get filtered out. What we're capturing is the over-the-road uh, response of the vehicle to that rough road surface, okay, which we get exposed to for hours. So we're not seeing the discrete events, but there are profiles that exist for trucks, for planes, for aircraft uh, that we can use and, and play on these vibration systems. As I mentioned a moment ago, that focus simulation where companies will mount data recorders on their truck and they'll, t they'll record five, ten different trips with that truck and take that data and average it together and use that and we can load that into our vibration system and reproduce, reproduce your truck ride. 
Um, uh, you know, a lot of these standards are taken from roads in North America. Uh, there's being work done globally but uh, to characterize roads and vehicles, but a lot of them are in North America. A lot of them are trips across the country that are instrumented and used for these general simulation profiles. How helpful is that to you when you're shipping product from Anderson to Greer? Maybe not so valuable. That's a 30-minute trip. And these tests are de designed to, to, uh, to simulate hours uh, of transit, 10, 20, 30 hours of transit if we're going all the way down to Mexico. So if you're in that category of products from, from uh, Anderson to Greer, maybe it's even more valuable for you to instrument your own vehicle and know what your, your vibration profile looks like and, and damage exposure uh, could be. Okay, uh, another one is compression, compressive forces. And we see it being done here with a, with a unit load product where we, and two ways to approach this. One, from a performance uh, testing approach would be to say, hey, let's calculate what kind of compressive loads we could see in the distribution environment in, as, we, as we stack these things in a warehouse. We're gonna stack these things two, three high. We can calculate a load that will be applied to our unit on the bottom bottom layer, let's just apply and release, or apply and hold for an hour or for three hours uh, that, that load and see how our package product responds to that. The other approach I would consider to be more the engineering pr approach that we, in, that we include in the development phase is to, we're going to compress it until, we, until it fails. We want to know how much load our package product system together, where maybe our product can share in the load bearing is what, what load that whole system is able to, uh, to support. Environmental conditioning, particularly when it comes to compressive forces or dynamic compressive forces and vibration, environmental conditioning becomes a very important step in the process. A lot of our materials, for, for a lot of us in here, we do a lot of returnables, largely made from polymers uh, or, or steel racks. Temperature might be a bigger issue if we're dealing with polymers. But a lot of us for whom we are dealing with expendable packaging uh, that involves paper-based, corrugated materials, moisture is, is significant, has a significant effect on the mechanical properties of these materials. And so it's, in, it's important for us in conjunction with compression to know what environmental conditions that we're at equilibrium with. Often could be standard conditions, that's fine, 23 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity, but there might be interest in us uh, testing at really high, high temperature, high humidity. It was nice out here this morning. A week ago, it's not so nice, it was hot and humid. And, and our packaged products go through this environment and it has a big influence on our compression performance. So I just want to briefly hit on some other test elements, maybe that aren't as typical in some of the test methods that, that we use, but are available to you as you are constructing maybe your organization's custom design, design plan or, or test plan. There's a, a tip over test, fork truck handling course, horizontal impact, concentrated impact, and, and what's called a bridge impact. And I just want to show you briefly what these look like. Okay, the tip over, tip over or tip test, uh, the, hopefully it's a tip test. If we get to the point where things are tipping over because our base is so small and our center of gravity is so high that we actually have the propensity to tip over, then, then it, what's recommended is a tip over test where you find the balance point and push it past that and let it go and see what happens to your packaged products. The tip test is let's take it to 22 degree tip and release it and see if it comes back. And, and, and is helpful in, de in developing uh, the footprint necessary to maintain stability of what could be a top load, uh, a top heavy uh, package product system. Uh, another, and this is, this is gaining in popularity, this is actually, uh, the, the photos I've shared with you here are directly from the ISTA, International Safe Transit Association's approach to, to four truck handling course. Uh, as they specify in a couple of their standards. And it involves a course set up with some predetermined size hazards that are placed along the floor, different heights and configurations, and you drive over the course with the packaged product at about a medium to slow walking speed, and then you back up and that's one cycle. We do four of these cycles, we change orientations if it's a four-way pallet, and we do another four, okay? And we're looking for effect, obviously, on product, 
package products, that, that whole system's ability to maintain unit load stability. I mentioned the, the rail car coupling, okay? And the fact that, that the incline impact test is not designed to simulate that impact. And, and, and largely because of the duration of the impact. To, to maintain that long duration, it could be 30 milliseconds, it could be 300 milliseconds. Uh, we need specialized equipment to do that because the impacts that occur with the incline impact tester are more on the order of two to three to four, maybe five milliseconds. So these are a lot longer events Intensity is lower, but because of that lower frequency input, that might match a fragility of our package product systems, and we might see, and these are horizontal loads, right? So we might see a loss of integrity of our whole unit load. We could pass the incline impact test, but we, don't, we can't pass the, the horizontal impact test. This equipment is expensive. There's, there's limited labs that have this available, but there are some here, certainly in the southeast, that uh, up in North Carolina, that, that have, and one in Georgia, that, uh, that have this kind of equipment. Okay, another concentrated impact it applies to our small things. Uh, we ship through, uh, if you could imagine, a UPS distribution environment uh, that we ship through, and all the, the freight, all the package to package interactions, concentrated impacts that could occur, also happens in the back of our trucks, where interaction of freight in, in the back of our trucks. Uh, is, is, gives, can be uh, simulated through um, a, a concentrated impact. So it's a certain impact energy level and, and different ways of imparting that. Lastly, the bridge impact. This is, uh, again, this is going to be small parcel environments where we've got a, a box that is specified to a weight and a certain hardness edge treatment that we drop on top of our packaged product. And, uh, and it's just another option for manual handling for that we see in mechanical handling inside these distribution centers that's uh, documented and is available for, for you to incorporate. What you can expect when you go through this lab testing is to get a really complete lab report. Documenting you know, everything that was done, uh, there's opportunities for photographs and video and even high speed video. A lot of labs have this capability to shoot at, at several thousand frames per second to slow down the interaction that your product might have with its packaging or components within your product and their response to vibration and shock events, which can, can give you a lot of insight that our eyes can't see, even if we're in the, in the room that day. You know, I just want to leave you with a few best practices. Um, I, I can't stress enough the importance of understanding your distribution environment. To, to understand all the steps that happen between that A and B and maybe C, uh, to firsthand watch these things happen. There are a lot, of, a lot of things we take for granted that we think, hey, I, a truck took this away. Certainly this is being handled only by truck. But if your LTL carrier very possibly is taking that truck and bringing it right to a rail yard, because it is less expensive for them to move that product ver, uh, via rail car, and it ends up going through a handling system that places this on a on a rail car, on a, on a flatbed rail car, and, and that spends a, a, you know, a dominant amount of its time in transit on a train. Um, we take for granted in the U.S. that we handle pallet loads with four trucks. We go outside the U.S. and there, are, I, I've seen, heard cases of where, where pallet loads are even handled manually. There's not a four truck available. And so it, there's nothing like seeing uh, and, and understanding your distribution environment. I encourage people to overpackage to get things to the test lab. We don't want to include whatever happened getting your products to the test lab as part of the test. So either we're going to overpackage or we're going to we're going to send people there and inspect them prior to the prior to the test, uh, so that we know the condition of our packaging, the conditioning of our products prior to, to starting our test. It's also very important to provide, uh, to, to have clear damage criteria, both for your product, what constitutes damage and what doesn't, and for your packaging, what constitutes damage and what doesn't. The lack of clarity there on the part of organizations conducting these tests leads to results that, that really aren't helpful. So, so clarity up front on that is important, and I've mentioned this already, the importance of being there, seeing, Hearing what it sounds like for your packaged product to undergo a vibration or a shock event. 
So with that, I'll leave you with an image of uh, uh, our last speaker, James, was uh, based out of CU ICAR, the, Inter the International Center for Automotive Research. They've had nine vehicles that they've developed as part of their Deep Orange program. This is, this is vehicle number nine uh, that was just introduced last year. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. Can you, um, I don't know, change the criteria, in other words, vibra vibration testing for double stacked pallets? Mm. And then that compared to rail versus truck versus sea versus air. Uh, you know, and then if it's overhanging the pallet a little bit, how does that impact? I mean, there are way to put in those different variances to understand what can happen. That's more real life, at least more in my real life. <laughs> Yeah, dealing with double stacked unit loads yeah. and loads that overhang the pallet or underhang and the effects of that when you stack them, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I would encourage you to test under those configurations, okay, with, the, with a caution, okay. A, a lot of these tests, and when it comes to vibration, since you mentioned vibration in particular, these vibration profiles are, are generated by recording a bunch of vehicles, averaging all this together. And then I mentioned the time compression. They will increase the intensity of that profile to decrease the test time. And that works. Maybe like you could, cook, uh, you could cook your cake a little faster if you increase the temperature, okay? But if you increase it too much, you burn the cake and everything inside doesn't get cooked, okay? That same thing can happen in package testing is that we, that we burn the cake. And when we start to double stack, taking vibration profiles that are already time compressed, I have seen an over testing of the package products because of the amplification that occurs through that double stack. And typically, you know, our, our, our lower levels don't see as high a vibration level as we do at the top because of that amplification that occurs through the stack. And so I, I often see an overtesting that occurs when we do double stack. So being sure to make sure you're using profiles that, that aren't significantly time compressed, okay? And those are available. Oftentimes we see um, a lot of, uh, I, I consider overpackaging. In your lab report, do you ever um, see it pass, but actually could say for one-time use expendable packaging that you could actually downgrade the material to, for a cost savings or a material savings? Yeah, good question. So, you know, as a testing lab, uh, you know, our job is to perform the test, give you the results, um, so that a lot of those decisions can be made, you know, uh, by, you know, by you, okay, as, as the customer. However, when you come, and, and one of the benefits of being there in the test is you're, you're conducting this test with technicians in the lab who see a lot of this stuff. And just in, and in conversation, we can, we, we can comment to the, you know, off the record, um, wow, we're, we're, we're overpackaged here. And, and to that point, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of, of overpackaged product. We don't know what, what kind of inputs these things are getting. We really don't know the fragility of our product. Let's just beef up the packaging. But then we're spending that, we're, we're doing that overspend on every unit we ship out the door, right? So yeah, there's, there's definitely, definitely a lot of that that we see. And an opportunity to comment, not officially so, in, in the form of a report. So good, thank you. So you do a lot of testing for damages during transit, point A to point B, like you said, as far as internal damage. Do you do any testing for any environmental factors such as corrosion or damages inside the packaging? So things other than physical forces? Yes. Is that, is that safe to say? Yes. Um, you know, corrosion, uh, you know, it changes in pressure, atmospheric pressure. We're going to put something in an airplane, what's the effect? We're going to put something in a truck and drive it through the Eisenhower Tunnel on I-70 going through Colorado and get up to nearly 12,000 feet. Pressure changes, yes. Corrosion, there are test methods to do that. It's not something that we do, do in our lab. Um, you know, beyond just putting something in an environment uh, where we control temperature and humidity to, to some high level. And we have done that. 
you know, we've done even, even short, you know, I know a lot of our products in here are made of, of metals that, for which they exhibit corrosion and maybe they, we can't even put coatings on them. And it, we're exposing them to an environment over the course of just a few days where we can even begin to see some surface rust. That kind of testing, yes. But long-term salt sprays, uh, months at a time, we're not set up well for that, but I'd be happy to direct you to some labs that can. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, there's probably other things we can think of. UV exposure. How about exposure to rain? We make the assumption that our packaged products stay under a roof all the time. But even that might be a loose, uh, you know, a loose assumption to make. So, thank you. Good morning. Um, is there an ASTM standard for um, a preload on a compression test? Preload on a compression test, yes. So let's think about the, the purpose of the preload is to really square up that package product unit and establish a start condition. So it's going to be a function of how much compressive load that, that unit can hold. What ASTM, there's a standard D642, I think. You can look that up, uh, ASTM.org, uh, uh, will specify compressive load, a preload, based on the number of walls of corrugated board in the container. And it's that simple. So, uh, so a, fi a, a, double, a single wall is like 50 pounds, double wall is 100 pounds, and a triple wall is like 500 pounds. But really the important part is you're, you're, you're applying a preload that's a percentage of what we think the maximum load is for the purpose of squaring everything up, right? So that we can start at zero and do that for every package product that we're going to conduct that test to. Um, particularly important when deflection is, the, is, is a component in what you're looking at. Right? You're, going to get the, you're going to get the total load no matter what, but how much deflection occurred, we want a preload to make that decision. Good question. Well, let's give uh, Dr. Bat a round of applause. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.